we begin the service today, we'll sing number 195, He Whispers Sweet Peace to Me. <clears throat> <clears throat> good to see everyone this morning. It's good to be out and to be able to come together that we might join at one in one and be able to hear the words that our Lord has for us and to be encouraged in his work here upon the earth. I could not go on without him I know, the song we just sung. The world would overwhelm my soul. For I could not see the right way to go when temptations o'er me roll. Yes, he whispers sweet peace to me. If that is our mind today, if that's the things that we understand, that we can't go on on our own. We can't be victorious in this by ourselves. But we must put our full faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all the promises that he has made to us, he will fulfill. So let's thank him for what he's done. Be constantly doing that. 
and looking to him for our help this morning, knowing that it's not man that it comes from, that if it's anything good, it comes from God the Father through his Son to us here upon the earth. So let's get the things of this world out of our mind this morning, and let's get Satan at bay. The scripture says that if we'll draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. And he says that if we resist Satan, he has to flee from us. And I know that he can tempt you and tempt me at a moment's time. As he did our Lord and Savior when the Lord said that he saw Satan fall from heaven or fall as lightning from heaven. He was so quick and so strong in the temptations that he would bring upon all of us and that he brought upon Jesus Christ, but he did not falter in the least. He was able to just use the power that God had given to him to overcome him. And by him being able to overcome, we have that same opportunity today, friends. So let's look to him this morning for guidance, for help, for wisdom, that we can walk with him in his work today. We've turned to Luke this morning. We'll read some here. Starting at the 13th chapter. Let's read the last couple of verses there of the 12th chapter of Luke. Starting at the 58th verse. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate. If we are in trouble, the magistrate is there. Jesus Christ there is the adversary against sin here upon the earth in us. The magistrate there is God the Father, the way I look at that. And he says that when we are there with the adversary, with Jesus, and going to the magistrate because that we may be in trouble with something, that we have something that needs to be cleaned up in us, he says, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him. Give diligence that we may have that sin delivered out or taken away from us and then we may be delivered in righteousness. Because if we don't follow these things and if we don't get it cleaned up here while we're in the land of the living, he says, lest he hail thee to the judge. And the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. The judge is God the Father. And if we're delivered unto him in that undone condition, then we'll be judged in that, eternally judged in that. And he says, the officer then cast you into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. And we've got that opportunity today to know him. We've got the opportunity to use 
the power of God to overcome all things here upon the earth. There is nothing that can overwhelm us spiritually if we'll just put it into the hands of Jesus Christ. As he says, go with him. He is there at the right hand of God the Father today, mediating for us. He is there. And if we'll just take it to him and put it into his hands, then we can be cleaned of these things. We can be forgiven for them. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? He said, What do you suppose? There are some things there that had taken place there that, was, that uh, Pilate had done that the people were not pleased with and that they looked upon it that there was a great wrong that was done. But the Lord, and they were telling the Lord about it. And the Lord just said, suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. He says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Except you repent. If you don't repent of your sins and walk in the work, let the Lord be directing you in it. He says you are no different from those that Pilate there that he killed in whatever manner that it might be. He says there's no difference in you. You'll perish the same way. You'll perish naturally and you'll perish spiritually. Because you're no different if you do not repent of your sins and go to our Lord and Savior for that power. On, these, on those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners above all men that dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. These are words of our Lord and Savior. And he was just telling there were certain people there, many of them it looked like, that had died an untimely death. But what did that death do? It didn't do anything there that was different from what's going to happen to all of mankind. All of mankind will die and give up that spirit that is within this body. But there's one thing that can be a difference from that. Whether or not we have that spirit of the Holy Ghost within us and whether or not then we have eternal life or, or we have eternal damnation. And he's telling us how we can avoid that. Repent, he says, and stay repented each and every day. Look to him and repent of our sins if we are found in that condition. But walk in that spirit so that we are not found constantly at, at difference from him. But he says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. This man. He had planted this tree. He had, ex he had expected to get fruit off of it. He had expected to be able to see it produce. But what was taking place? Let's listen carefully. He said, I, and he, he said to the, but he found no fruit when he came there. And he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? The man had planted a tree and maybe worked it. He had someone there looking after it. He says, why? It's not bringing forth fruit. Just cut it down. 
But the man there, he answered and said unto him, his dresser, the one that was taking care of it, he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and done it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Think about ourselves, and I believe that he is telling these things to us, to those that he has planted and he has given that earnest of the Spirit to. He's planted that righteous seed there within us. And he wants to see fruits in us. He wants to see us grow. He wants to see us get away from the worldly things and to grow spiritually. But look at the mercy that he has. He is not quick, and in other places it tells that he's not quick with his anger. But he's merciful and long-suffering, it says, to us, to his children. And even though he was not bringing forth good fruit, the dresser, and I believe that could be looked upon as Jesus Christ there. He is the one that can help us. He is the one that if we'll go to him, he will be able then to do just as this man was going to do to that plant. He was going to dig about it so that it could get all the nutrients and all the rain could come in and go to it and help it to grow and he would put fertilizer around it so that it would be nourished. And that's exactly what our Lord and Savior will do to us. He will nourish us spiritually. He will give us that sincere milk of the word to begin with and then he will be able to give us that strong meat that we'll be able to understand and we'll be able to live by that work, by that spirit. And then he says, if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. So let's be careful. Let's walk in the spirit. And let's don't be cast out. Let's bring forth fruit. What does he say? By their fruits, you shall know them. And that's what I want us to be doing is bringing forth fruits of righteousness so that we will be able to, that God and, and the people will be able to, God knows all about us, but that people will be able to see and know and understand the fruits that we are bringing forth and give God the honor, give God the, pre, the glory in all of that, not us at all. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there is a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could no wise lift up herself. This woman had been in that condition a long time. But she was somewhere. She had gone to where Jesus Christ was. She was there. And when Jesus saw her, he called her unto him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thy, thy infirmity. Look how that just took place. And I believe that that took place because that this woman was somewhere in the presence of the Lord. Maybe there as he was there around other people. Maybe as he was going through. But she saw him. And the Lord called her unto him. And I believe that he can call us unto him, but do we have ears to hear? And then are, when he calls, are we willing to accept? I know he's calling. But are we willing to accept him? We have to make that choice before we can ever receive of that earnest of the Spirit is making the choice ourselves when he calls, will you answer? And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, 
because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Look at this self-righteousness that this person had. To come and be healed on the six days and not to come on the Sabbath day to be healed. Not recognizing that God the Father was the one who had given this power to, for Jesus Christ to be able to heal this woman that had an infirmity for 30 and 8 years. Bowed together. Satan had bound her there. And you and I, we can be bound for years and years and years spiritually. And you can be loosed any day. Any day throughout the week or on the Sabbath or whenever that power of God is available to be healed spiritually. And that's what Jesus Christ was showing here in that day. That the power of God is available for people to be healed naturally, spiritually, whatever it might be. If it's the will of God, let it be done. It does not matter when. But just be thankful that it's the will of God and that we can see and know and understand that. And that's what this man ought to have been doing. But he was very upset about someone receiving something from God. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? says, now you think here. I want you to listen and look at what goes on here. The Lord didn't have any respect at all for Satan in this man, even though he was the ruler of the synagogue. The Lord did not show any respect for what he had said. He just looked upon him. And he says, thou hypocrite. You are a hypocrite. Trying to proclaim that you are following God but then not at all listening and seeing the power that he has going on here upon the earth now. And that can be exactly with us, friends. If we proclaim to be a Christian, but then we do not understand and do not walk in his spirit, still have that carnal mind, and that carnal mind leading us into things of the world instead of listening and watching what he'd have for us to do today. But listen carefully. He says, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to water him? You'll take that animal and do something good for it so it can sustain life. And here you are complaining because... This woman on the Sabbath day was healed of this infirmity that was within her. And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? The Lord just spelled it out for him very plain and clear. And shouldn't today each one of us be loosed from the bond of Satan by listening to the call of Jesus Christ. When he says, come unto me, do we have those ears to hear? And are we willing then to do as he says? Say, yes, I will come unto you. I will accept you and repent of our sins. What did he say? Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish with the wicked if we do not repent of our sins. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that God had done by him. All of his adversaries, he says, were ashamed then for the thoughts that they had had. They were 
an adversary against Satan, against the work. But when he came down upon them and showed them here, he says it looks like they were ashamed and all the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. Maybe some had their eyes open there, whether or not the ruler of the synagogue did or not. But I believe that there was others there that did have their eyes open and they were ashamed at the thoughts that had been in their mind. How about us today? And can we have those eyes to see today? Are we ashamed that we might have let Satan lead us away into something to be deceived? Are we walking upright with him? And I know that there are people that's doing that. Walking upright with him. So that then they are all at one with Jesus Christ and God the Father. Then said he, Unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast it into the garden, and it grew, and it waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Think about this. In our life, and now he's talking about what that spirit can do for us. He says, unto what is the kingdom of God like and to wherein shall I resemble it? What is the kingdom of God? What is the spirit of the Holy Ghost like in you and in all of mankind today, he says? He says, it's like a grain of mustard seed. It starts out small. You get a little bit of understanding. You get a little bit of that earnest of the spirit that is able to come into your life and to start working with you. That grain of mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds possible that we see. But it grows and it can grow into a big plant and produce. And that's what he's saying here that can happen there with us is that small amount of faith that small amount of the spirit that is given to us when we see him and we know him and we're able to take that then and let it grow within us by that faith increasing more and more and then the knowledge of, of his work, the knowledge of his spirit there within us growing and producing more and more, just as that plant does, it starts from that small seed and continues to grow. How are we growing today? Do you see that in yourself? That you are growing spiritually, just as this started from that very small little seed and made a huge plant. Are you growing spiritually? Is that work within you today? Has it grown from where it was a year ago? Are you stronger in the spirit, in the faith? And do you see and know that he is walking with you? And you have the protection of him over Satan. And again he said, Whereunto I shall liken the kingdom of God. It is like leavening which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Also, you can take that leaven, that flour or that meal, whatever it is, and if it doesn't have any leavening in it, it will not rise. It will not bake properly. You can put all the other ingredients in it and put it in and cook it and it's not going to rise up and be something that is good and edible. It will not be as it should. But if you take that leavening, that little bit, and you put it there in that meal or in that flour and you mix the other ingredients in with it and you bake it, it will rise and become larger and be edible and be something that is useful for the person that is doing it. And again, look at the spiritual part. 
We can proclaim that, yes, I'm a Christian. We can have this tabernacle here that we can use to serve him. But if it does not have that spirit of the Holy Ghost within it, that, it is nothing. It will not do us any good whatsoever. That spirit of the Holy Ghost is that leavening that then when it's mixed with this tabernacle, it's mixed with that spiritual part, it will grow into something that is good. Just as that seed, that tiny seed of that spirit that earnest of that spirit will grow into something good. And that's what we need to be looking for today. Do we understand the parable that he's talking about? And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Here was Jesus again, just going through the cities, teaching to repent, to accept me as your Savior. Now I want us to think about what the opportunity that we have today. And, but when it comes right down to the bottom thing, that's all he's asking for out of you and me today. It's the same thing. Jesus Christ was going through the villages preaching and teaching, journeying on toward Jerusalem, which is where he wanted to go. There were some that accepted him all the way along the way. Then said one unto him, some didn't accept him too. Are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, listen carefully. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Why? Why? Why, he says, if they're seeking to enter in, why shall they not be able to enter in? What is it in our lives? Are we seeking? Now let's go on and read some of the things that he has to say. He says, when once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door and began, and ye began to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know, know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. And he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Now these are words again that our Lord was telling the people there. When you go back over there, one of the people there that was around as he went through these towns teaching and preaching, one of them just asked him that question. He says, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the gate, the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. One of the other places he <laughs> speaks of that straight gate, he says it's narrow. He says, narrow is the way. And he says, few there will be that finds that narrow path. He says, there is a broad road that leads to destruction. And he says, many will be on that broad road. Where are we today? I want us to just stop and think about what he's saying here to us all. Because it's a very serious matter. It's the most serious matter that should be in any of our minds this morning. It's where will I spend eternity? Am I following the things that we have been reading this morning? Is that a part of my life? Or am I on that broad road? 
strive to enter in at the straight gate. He says, now, when once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door, and you began to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. He says, I don't know you. They were proclaiming to be something as the man there a while ago, and he called him a hypocrite because he was not who he was claiming to be. And there will come a time that we all live here upon the earth just like there. He gave the parable there also about the fig bush, and he says it's been here three years and it hadn't brought any, any fruit. The dresser said, let me work about it. Let me give it some attention. And then if it does not bring fruit, cast it down, cut it down. And that's what he's talking about here. I believe that he's talking about here. He says many will seek to enter in. Many thought that they were walking in that way. But they were being deceived by Satan. They did not understand the truth. They were not able to discern the truths of God but was allowing Satan to deceive them and to keep them in a mind, a carnal and a worldly mind. He says, when once the master of the house has risen up, is shut to the door and you begin to stand without, you're not a part of that kingdom. You are standing outside of the kingdom of God. The master, Jesus Christ, has come. He has shut the door. Just as the marriage there of the ten virgins. Some of them had to go away, but when they came back, the door was shut and they could not enter into the marriage. The same thing is happening here. The master has come and he shut the door. And all of those, he says, there they come and they knock on the door saying, Lord, Lord open to us isn't that a sad thing to think about and then they start telling him we've eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets we've seen you we've been around you but what did he say to them I tell you I know you not whence you are depart from me all you workers of iniquity. What are we working in today? What is, what is our life showing? Is the spirit of the Lord shining bright in your works, in your mind? But look what he says. Depart from me. I know ye not. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and ye yourselves thrust out. And there'll be a time just as he showed there where the rich man, he, the parable there of him. And he could look away off and he could see Abraham and he could see Lazarus, the poor beggar there in Abraham's bosom there in a good place in heaven. He was there in paradise. And he was in torment. And that's what he's talking about here. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, knowing that our opportunity is going, knowing, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ has plainly said, depart from me, you are a worker of iniquity. And he thrust them out. And they, can't, they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall set down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. 
those that look upon themselves as being little, as last, not looking upon themselves as being first, and putting their thoughts and their ways first, but putting the Jesus Christ and God the Father first and their instructions first. That's the ones that will be first in the kingdom of heaven. That's the ones that will be there glorifying him. That's the ones that will be going through that straight and narrow gate. But those that are on that broad road, they're looking upon that they know what to do and they are putting their thoughts, their mind, their wisdom first. And they will be last in the kingdom of heaven. They will be cast out, cast out into eternal damnation. <clears throat> the same day came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. Certain people came there warning him. They were the Pharisees. They were just warning him. And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow, and the following day, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. He knew why he had come here to the earth. And he knew what the power was, what the man had, all the power that man had. And he knew that he could have nothing except what God gave him. <coughs> oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. We read these things and we think about that. How foolish were these people. Here is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and he was doing all manner of, of miracles and preaching the truth and teaching them something that was way better than what they had been involved in. And here, but Jesus just looking around and Jerusalem there, the city there where God's people had been. And he, it should have been a righteous place. But him just looking upon it and, and with sadness says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The things that you have done here, killing the prophets, stoning them that are sent unto thee, sent unto thee from whom? From God. And he says, how often would I have gathered thy children together if you would have just accepted me, if you would have listened to my teachings, I would have gathered you together with the protection of God. And that's what he's telling all of us today. Hear his word and accept it. Let's don't be as these people not accepting it. We are here a group of people that he has worked with and is continuing to work with. And let's accept it. Let's don't be that he would come and say, oh, people here today. He says, you have, would it, could it be in our mind that he could be saved? You have turned down the marvelous instructions that I have given you. Nothing different than killing the prophets and stoning them that were sent unto thee just not accepting it 
If that's the case with anybody here today, you're no different than that. If we are not accepting his word as the truth. And he says there, if you would have just listened, if you would have just accepted it, I would have given you the protection just as that hen, when danger comes around, when she sees and knows there, she would gather her flock, all of the little ones, the little chickens, the little bitties, and bring them under her wings and kind of stoop down so that she had them all covered and nothing could harm them. And he said that he would do the same thing for each and every one of us if we would just listen. Now that mother hen had a way of gathering them and letting them know that there was danger there. And our Lord and Savior has a way to gather his people and let them know that there is danger, that Satan is lurking. He is right around. He's right in the midst wanting to destroy you. But don't let him. Use the power of God. Use that the promises that he has promised to us. And use that faith to be strong in the power and be brought into the fold and be brought under the protection of God. Behold, though, he says now, he says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I want that spiritual tabernacle that I have, that house that he has given me, that that spirit of the Holy Ghost can dwell within. I don't want it to be desolate. I want it to be bubbling with the growth of the Spirit of the Lord. And we can all have that. We can be producing, we can be using His Word to put that leavening right within us so that we can grow spiritually. We can use that earnest of the Spirit, that little, great, that little seed, to grow and not be at all desolate. He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, Ye shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, what are we looking for here today? What are we doing? He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And he's talking about those that are not walking with him. And he says, Then you shall not see me. You shall not understand that I am the God, Son, that I am the Son of Man that has come to save the world. You're not accepting me, but there will come a day when you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You will bow to him. Everybody will bow to him at that time. The righteous are bowing now and accepting him and will rise to meet him in the air to ever be with him. And I want to comfort you as he says with those words. To be a part of that, you can. You can accept him. You can let that, you can receive of that earnest of the spirit. You can let it grow. And you can use it to overcome all things here on the earth. Bow to him now. And then proclaim now, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Again, 
here he was, and don't you think about it, here he went into one of the, the chief Pharisees' house. And I believe that this man must have had some interest in what was going on there. But Christ said, I came to save sinners. He wanted to be there where sinners was, where they were, so that his word could be proclaimed to them, so that they could understand and receive of what he had to offer to them. And he had gone there to eat with him, to fellowship with him. And I believe while he was there, he would be preaching and teaching to him about what his father would have for us to do here upon the earth. And the people looked around and they saw that here was a man that had a, had a problem, had the dropsy. And Jesus answering, spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now here he knew he was right among a group of very educated people that knew the law and that proclaimed to be following God. Jesus, the Son of God, just looking upon them. And all of the Pharisees and all of these lawyers, and he asked them a question. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held her peace. And, they, and he took, them, took him and healed him and let him go. Those people there that could have even been one of the men there that had great indignation. He was the ruler of the, the synagogue. Could have been some people like that that was there. But when Christ, the power of God, just asked them the question, they didn't know what to say. Didn't have anything to say. They just held their peace. And Jesus took the man and he healed him and let him go. And answered them saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Again, God the Father giving the words to Jesus Christ so that he could confront those that had issues with the work that was going on in that day. And I know the same thing can be done today. That his truths can be explained. And his work will stand. And they could not answer him again. And Satan has to flee. Satan cannot stand up boldly against the work of the Lord. He will be put down in every incidence if we'll use that, what he has to offer to us. And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth the parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms saying unto them. And again, he, he was looking around in these, these people, this group of people that he was within. And some of them, as we just said, were very educated, were very high. And I believe a lot of these people there, the Pharisees that had come together there, there was a lot of them that felt very good about their self and what they had accomplished and how they were able to be there among that group of people. They felt very good about that. But what was Jesus doing? He was condemning their works, condemning their thoughts. I believe that these people there had some thoughts. They held their peace. They didn't say anything about Jesus healing that man and, that, and when he asked them the question. But I believe in their heart they had indignation about that. They were not pleased with what he did. That's why he just told them very plainly, it's very something similar to what he told the other, that if you have an animal that gets in a 
place where it can be harmed or it will not survive. He says, you will go in straight way and pull him out and give him his freedom on that Sabbath day. And they understood what he was talking about. And they couldn't answer him again in any of those things. And then he looked around throughout the people there, the rest of the people there, and he could see things that they were doing there that was not good. They had a mind that they wanted to be first, as he said a while ago, that those that want to be first will be last. And he said there, he just told them a parable. He gave them a parable of something there to listen to, to see and to apply it to their own life. And that's what we need to be doing today is taking these things and applying them to our own life so that it can be good for us. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, set not down in the highest room lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. He says, now be careful what you do. He says, if you've gone, you've been bidden to come, people have asked you, they've sent you an invitation to come and to be with us at certain function. He says, go, but go in a very meek and humble way and just go and sit down in the lowest room don't go to the highest place, to the honorable places. And he that bade thee, and him come and say to thee, give this man place, for thou began with shame, and thou began with shame to take the lowest room. Just keep a mind there that you want to be low, he says. And when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee come, cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I believe that ties back to what he was talking about there a while ago. They said, Behold, there are last that shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. I believe that is similar and basically the same thing that he's talking about here. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, looks upon himself as something better than what God does, and how that we've might be self-righteous in our ways. He says they will be brought down. But he says, he that humbleth himself, humbleth himself in the sight of God and sees how broken and undone that we are and that there is no good in us, he says, then they will exalt him with the spirit of God and let him see that that spirit is there and that that power is there and he has it to use and it can bring joy and peace and happiness to that man. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a, a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made unto thee. The Lord just calling these things out to several different people there. And now he's, he had talked to the people there that had come. He had talked to the lawyers and the Pharisees. He had talked there to just the people that had come, that had, had been invited to come. Now he's going there to the man that was putting on this, the Pharisee there that had invited all these people to come to him. And he says now, when you make a dinner or a supper that you want to bring in a lot of people, 
He says, Call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor and the maimed, the lame and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, or for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And these, are, again, are some things that we need to look into and see how are we doing in our day. Are we willing to do and to live as Christ was telling these people to live and to bring forth his fruit here upon the earth that we might be, resurrect, be in the resurrection of the just. And that is the goal that we all need and should have that we want to be a part of the resurrection of the just not a resurrection of the evil because they are going to be cast out they are going to be cast into that lake of fire where Satan and the false prophet are but that resurrection of the just will be resurrected to life that they then can be there for eternity, resurrected to eternal life through the teachings and through the life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when one of them that said it meet with him heard these things, he said unto them, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. You hear the Lord just teaching them, continuing to teach them, continuing to just give them one bit of instructions after the other. And when the man heard these things that had, had been invited there and was sitting there eating with them, and he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And let's be calling all of our friends to that feast that we might help them to eat of that and partake of that spiritual supper. And that's what this man was saying. Blessed is he that eateth bread in the kingdom of God that is able to take on that spiritual part. Are we inviting the people into that? Are we working and walking with them that they might be able to receive that part. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and he bade many. He invited many people and he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. Now I want you to think, he, this man here had said, blessed is he that eats bread in the kingdom of God. Now what he's talking about here is, what is what's taken place in the kingdom of God. Here upon the earth and afterward here is what he's saying. A certain man made a great supper and he invited many, he bade many. And who is that certain man? Jesus Christ has made a supper. He has prepared a spiritual supper for all of mankind. And he has invited all of mankind to come and partake of that. He did that when he was here upon the earth. And he, he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And he has been doing that since he was here upon the earth. He has been sending his servants throughout the world, his preachers, his teachers, whoever it might be in whatever condition it might be. You and I, each one of us, every one of us can be a teacher just in the words and how we live our life and go out and to teach others and to tell them to come and be a part of this supper that this master has prepared to be a part of that spiritual meal. Come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground 
and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. What lame excuses people could have and what lame excuses people can have today for not fully accepting and walking with him and being a part of that spiritual meal that Christ Jesus is offering to all. We can make up some pretty phony and pretty weak excuses in our life of why we aren't doing certain things. Well, let's listen on and be, listen carefully to what he said. They told him, they said, come. And they began to make excuses. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said unto his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. Now what's he saying here? He said, I've offered that to all of mankind. And there's people here that are turning it down. Now he says, to my servants, to my preachers, my teachers throughout the world. He says, now go. These people have turned it down. They are not accepting it. He says, now go. Wherever, into the streets, into the lanes, bring in the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And who is that? but those that are poor in their spirit. They see and know that they are blind spiritually. They see and know that they are crippled spiritually. They cannot walk in the way that they need to. They're blind. And he says, if you see that, say that you are blind, then I can give you eyes to see. But he's talking about those throughout everywhere that are broken spiritually. And he's also speaking of the natural part. Don't just look, as James says, if we have reverence to those that come in dressed in gay clothing and those that are maybe rich and whatever, if we look upon them more and we honor them more than we would that someone that came in with a vile raiment on, poor he says then you are judging you are sinning he says and what he's saying here is to go and when we see those teach it bring them in bring them into my kingdom bring them into the supper and the servant said Lord it is done as thou hast commanded thee, and yet there is room. There will always be room in that great supper that the Lord has to offer to us. There is always a plenty for each one of us. He will, it will never be filled. He always will have room for one more. The miracles that he did here upon the earth, he took the two fishes and the five loaves. And he fed thousands of people and he did not run out. There was plenty for all. And then some. And that's what he's talking about here. He went out and he invited and these people came in. But his servants, his teachers, his preachers says they are still room for more. He didn't say, all right, that's all that we need. What did he tell those preachers and teachers to do? And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Help all. Bring them all in. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. 
He says all of those that were bidden to begin with and had these phony excuses, these lame excuses of why they cannot come in and why they cannot follow me. He says they will not be able to taste one bit of that spiritual supper because they're not willing to put it all in. They're not willing to come as they are and just put it all into the hands of the Lord. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And I want, to under, I want to explain that. He's not talking about having just a hatred for them. He's talking about hating the works of Satan within them. If that's be the case with it. He says we've got to hate that and we've got to be. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And that's whatever it might be. It doesn't matter how close he's saying there that Satan might be right within your family members. He says, it does not matter how close. You've got to hate that enough that you will take up your cross and follow him. That whatever he says to put away, to rid yourself of, of the things of this world and take up your cross and come after me. He says, if you don't do these things, cannot be my disciple. And if we can't be his disciple, that means we're eternally lost. For which of you intending to build a tower setteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him. You start something out there without putting forth the right mind. Going out and starting on a journey there with Christ, saying, I'm going to accept him but not looking and seeing what the true cost of that, not looking and seeing how that you are really going to be able to accomplish that. There's only one way. You can't go about that haphazardly. It has to be only one way through Jesus Christ our Lord, knowing then that once we receive that, we have all that we need to continue and to finish the job. We will have it all. There, We will not come up short and others mock. Saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. If we count the cost and we put it, we know that it is impossible for us. Totally impossible for us to do it ourselves and we put it totally in the hands of Jesus Christ, then we will be able to finish that work. And it'll be a good work. Or what king going to make war against another king setteth not down first and, commit, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? We can all know that whatever is brought against us, we can accomplish. There is nothing, he says, that will be able to be brought upon you except there will be a way to escape it. He will give that way, and that's through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. <clears throat> or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desirous conditions of peace. And we know that Satan is more powerful than we are in our natural body. But with the power of God, then when we see those things, see what's out there, 
then we can go to Him and to desire how that we can overcome Satan and how that we can live at peace with Jesus Christ. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. If we do not forsake all that we have in this carnal mind, forsake those things and accept Jesus Christ fully and wholly. He says, you cannot be my disciple. Isn't that something to think about? You cannot be his disciple except you fully put away all things of that carnal mind and accept him. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Salt is good for many things. It enhances the flavor of food. It has saving power and other foods that you can use to preserve. And he says it's good. But he says if that salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? If that salt has been used or, or it, they may not have had the same quality of salt that we had in those days and it could have become old where it lost some of its seasoning power or if it had been used for preserving something then it was not good to do that again and he says that salt is good he says but if it's lost that where will it be able to be used for that and he says it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dun hill but men cast it out he that hath ears to hear let him hear And to finalize the sermon today, listen carefully to those words. He says, if we do not use that salt in the right and proper way, and we use it one time and we keep it there, don't let it be lost. He says, if you lose it then, he says, it's neither fit for the land. It's not good for anything. You can't put it on the land there. He says it's not good to put in the dunghill. He says, but men cast it out. They cast it out away so that it's not going to harm any of the things that they might be able to use. He that hath the ears to hear, let him hear. Do you have those spiritual ears today? Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Do you hear the call to come to the supper, the wedding, the wedding with God the Father and His Son to be married, to be with them, to be the bride? He is the bridegroom. And we can be that bride. And we can come and be married with Him. And we can be a part of that Wedding supper, that spiritual meal that is available to all. And we can understand then and be strong and be encouraged in his word. Don't be discouraged. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. And if you go on and you read the next chapter there, he talks about that lamb that was lost and how that they found it and how there was great rejoicing in heaven. And that's what he's wanting us to think about today. That we can be lost, but we can be found we can be resurrected. We can be quickened. 
be made alive spiritually through Jesus Christ. What a day that'll be. Then we can see him. And we can have the ears to hear that the things that we've read today and we can apply them to us. And we can be strengthened. Don't put it away. Be strong. Be begging. Pray. That he will give you wisdom and knowledge and understanding so that you can be strong in his work here on the earth. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. We will sing number 285, Blessed Assurance. And I know that that's what we've been talking about today, is blessed assurance of how we can have that. And if there's anyone that would like to make that commitment and repent of their sins and can come forward, as we sing number 285. I hope that each and every one of us today could sing that song and it be a realty in our heart that this is our story and this is our song throughout our life throughout our day praising my savior all the day long
praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen to that. Let us pray. To God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for the wonderful words of life that you have left recorded that we can read and we can discourse on and we can see what a wonderful opportunity that we have and we can see the mercy and love that you have here and have had for your people all the way along and how that you will give all of those that come to you, those ears to hear, that we might be justified at that final day through you, not through our works, but through your love and through your mercy and through your power. And then we'll be able to do a work that shows our faith and shows our love and shows your power. Again, we just thank you for all you've done. And we beg that you be with all of those that are struggling today, that are struggling spiritually to help them to become strong in the faith. And put you first in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.